I want to show you guys how I spent my holiday season, or at least what happened with me this holiday season. Um, but first I want to show, well, I mean, geez, but first. Well, anyway, the first thing that I want to show you is a shirt that I ordered myself. And I'm actually wearing uh, one of my favorite shirts today. This is my Cynic shirt. Um, Cynic is a very cool band. They're progressive, progressive metal. They used to be more of a death metal band. Um, actually, two of their members, Paul Masvidal and Sean Reiner, they played in Death, which is, of course, you know, like the, the most famous death metal band ever. They played on the Human album, which a lot of people think is the best death album. But most people don't even know who those two guys are because they're just like, Chuck Schuldiner forever! And I mean, yeah, Chuck is really cool, but... The shirt that I got was actually... Um, it was cheap. It was only $11, and they only had four left in stock when I ordered it, so I was really happy to pick it up. And I had been eyeing this shirt for a while, so when the price dropped so low, I was like, I am getting this. And I actually want to show you the back first. The back says, here they come, the ones who will destroy the earth. And my voice was getting muffled by the shirt there. And this is a shirt for a band called Cattle Decapitation, by the way. And so that's the logo. And then you have the Burger King, Ronald McDonald, Jack in the Box, and Colonel Sanders as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And I think that is fucking cool. Um, Cattle Decapitation is a really cool band. I listened to Monolith of Inhumanity which I believe is still their latest release. It was came out in 2012, so it's already like three years old. But it was an awesome album, just start to finish. And I'm not normally into like the brutal scene of death metal, but uh, and, like, I guess really they call themselves a death grind band or whatever, but it's really, really freaking hardcore. The drumming on everything they do is great. The guitar leads on that album are phenomenal. The bass is awesome. The vocals are awesome. Just everything is great. And I don't normally talk a lot about the lyrics in death metal because there's usually not a lot to talk about in lyrics in, in death metal. But these guys are really creative and they talk about a lot of like social issues, but they present it in a way... It, it's like kind of hard to explain. It's like... They'll, they'll talk about factory farming and how bad it is for the environment, but they'll illustrate their point by putting humans in the place of animals and saying, like, well, what if we treated humans like we treated animals? So you get this, like, interesting philosophical message at the same time that you, like, because of course the lyrics are still really brutal and gross. So it's kind of like you get the best of both worlds. Um, but yeah, they have a lot of really good stuff, um, and I'm really happy to have that shirt. So that's the first thing. Um, I'm gonna take some coffee. Okay, what'll we talk about next? Oh, this is something that I meant to make a vlog about a long, long ass time ago because I've had this sitting in my room since freaking July, I want to say, July or August. And I actually owe this to my friend Cameron, who, um, a long time ago, <laughs> a long time ago, in the summer, we went to the store in downtown Ann Arbor called To Get Your Game On. It is a small, like, game place, used game store. They sell new games, too, and they also do, like, tabletop games and card games and all sorts of games. Um, but I, I had been looking for two games for a while, and the last time I was there, one of them is Silent Hill 2, the best Silent Hill, and the other is Shadow of the Colossus. And these are both used games. Silent Hill 2 was 10, this was 15, um, but we went there, and, like, it was the third time we had been in that store, I think. And, um, and I was like, oh, I'm looking for Silent Hill 2, Shadow of the Colossus. So, like, three times we were there together. I had been there more times myself, actually, and they never showed up. I, I never saw the games there. But the very first time I had ever been in the store, I did see Silent Hill 2. They were selling it for $50, because I think it was a new copy. But anyway, so we were there together, and um, and we saw both of the games, and he was like, holy crap, these are, like, cheap. And I was like, yeah, it's, like, too bad I don't have any money to pay for them today. And he's like, dude, I will buy them for you, and because you, you like, can't leave this place without... Like, he insisted, basically, on, like, buying these two games for me. And I paid him back and everything, so it's... So it's all cool, but um, I haven't even actually had a chance to play them because it happened right before the semester started, but that's a fun little story that I just figured I'd tell. Um, so this was something that my parents got me. It's a turtle, a glass turtle, 
I have lots of turtles. I'd show off my turtle collection in an entirely separate vlog, but this is the first glass turtle I've ever had before. I have stone turtles, I have metal turtles, I have wooden turtles, I have all kinds of turtles. I have a mosaic turtle over there hanging against the wall. I don't want to move the camera because I'm lazy. Um, I have a turtle on my keychain. I have all kinds of fucking turtles in my room. Uh, so, it's kind of a traditional sort of gift deal thing in the jig um, that my parents got me. And then there was this, which I was not expecting, and it's really awesome. It's this huge hunk of amethyst. And this is amazing. Like, you, it's growing on the geode. And you can actually, like, on the sides, you can kind of see where the quartz is as well. So this is really cool. Amethyst is one of my favorite pieces. I have an enormous rock collection, which, like my turtle collection, I'd show off in a different video. Um, but amethyst is one of my favorites because it's purple, and purple is my favorite color. Um, and then, oh geez, should I tell this story? I told this story on a, uh, on a vlog. This was something that my mom really got more for her than for me because I've seen it already. But this is Monster. Naoki Urasawa's Monster, and it's an awesome show, and you should watch it, because it's really, really fucking good. I'll read the back, I'll read the blurb, so I can get you guys hooked on it. What would you do if a child you saved grew up to be a monster? An ice-cold killer is on the loose, and Dr. Kenzo Tenma is the only one who can stop him. Tenma, a brilliant neurosurgeon with a promising future, risks his career to save the life of a critically wounded young boy named Johan. When the boy, now a cold-hearted and charismatic young man, reappears nine years later in the midst of a string of unusual serial murders, Tenma must go on the run to uncover the story of Johan and stop the monster he set loose upon the world. Conspiracies, serial murders, and secret government experiments set against the grim backdrop of the former East Germany are masterfully woven together in this compelling work of suspense. And it's really good. Um, but this is the DVD box set. And when I say the DVD box set, I mean this is the only box in the DVD box set because fucking Viz Media didn't release any of the other fucking fucking fuck. So uh, we have the first 15 episodes of Monster. There are 74 episodes in the show on DVD and none of the other ones. So we've hooked my dad's laptop up to our TV. We've been watching the series online and it's like... It's, yeah, my mom is so fucking sucked in. It's like... She's hopeless. <laughs> anyway, um, God, more coffee, right? All right, I guess we're getting into the cello things now, which is the last thing we'll do before we talk about the Toho keychains, which I've been so intriguing you with in my Spyro Let's Play. Um, so basically, there were just a whole bunch of tchotchkes that my mom picked up, um, and I, by a whole bunch of, I really mean there's only a couple things, but they're like miscellaneous cello supplies. Um, basically, she got me rosin, which I didn't need because I already had this rosin. And if you don't know about how string instruments work, like cellos and violins, um, I can actually show you my bow. Hang on a second here. Oh, it's in the corner. This is my bow. It's what you use to make the strings vibrate. And this part of the bow right here, like, um, the light part, is actually horsehair. Um, either synthetic horsehair or real horsehair, like, the, a lot of bows still use real horsehair. I'm pretty sure most bows still use real horsehair, but to be honest, I don't really know all that much about it. Um, bows are expensive. Good bows are expensive. This bow... I think the price was $2,600, but we paid like $2,200 or $2,400 because we got it in a bundle with the cello itself. The cello itself was $10,000. Um, that's what the person who was selling it wanted. Uh, it, it was actually being sold to us by a professional cellist. Um, she, she wanted $10,000 for it because it's a nice cello, and I mean, it is a really, really fine instrument. And it took her apparently all of the way through her master's degree in music performance. So, um, when we talked her down to 8,000, it was, like, really worth it. Or maybe it was 9,000 or 8,800, 8, I can't remember. It was my parents who paid for it, so, you know. Uh, yeah, they actually even took out a loan to, to finance it. 
And that was back when I still wanted to be a music performance major, and then I decided that that was a terrible idea, and I stopped being a music performance major. And you should never be a music performance major, because being a music performance major is terrible, and how many times can I say music performance major in one sentence? Well, anyway, um... But yeah, if you want money, don't play a stringed instrument. The case for the cello, the case that I have is, like, normally sold for $1,400, but we got a defective case that had a broken hinge. It's not really broken, it's just not in perfect condition, so they can't sell it for um, full price, or they can sell it at full price at Char, which is where we buy everything, which is actually a local company, by the way. Um, so we only paid a thousand for a fourteen hundred dollar case, and you can see how quickly this adds up. I actually need to put new strings on my cello too, which is, um, now normally this is like a cleaning cloth, because what happens is you get the rosin on your bow, and it like, it, it makes the strings, I, I can't even describe what happens, it makes the bow sticky, so it pulls the strings and vibrates them, basically. That's how it works, but it, it leaves residue on the strings. Nor and like some dust and stuff like that, so normally you can use a microfiber cleaning cloth like this to get some of it off, um, but my strings are filthy, I need new strings. I actually really should clean off my fingerboard too, it's really dirty, um, but I'm kind of scared because the best way to do that is with rubbing alcohol, and if you get rubbing alcohol on any part of the instrument other than the, um, than the fingerboard, it'll take off the varnish and it'll look awful, and it could even affect the sound. So, um, there's that. And then the two, I guess, more major gifts. Oh, oh my god, I'm falling over in my own chair. I got this, which is, um, Starker's edition of the Six Cello Suites. Yano Starker. Hang on a second, I have a book. I didn't intend to show this off, but I actually have his, um, his autobiography. This is him. He died technically two years ago. I mean, it's January 5th, 2015. Um, but he died in 2013, in like May, I want to say. He's the best cellist that ever lived. I'm 100% convinced of that. Um, you can look up the crazy, crazy amazing performances that he's done. He's famous for playing uh, the Kodai Cello Sonata, which is like the most technically difficult cello piece ever written. Or a lot of people say it's the most technically difficult cello piece ever written. I think it's very, very debatable. But Bach is, um, the unaccompanied suites for the cello are basically, like, the most important repertoire in the entire cello world. There are six suites. There's the first one, which is in G major, which is very, very famous. If you've ever seen a cello in a movie or a TV show or anything like that, chances are they are playing the prelude to the first suite, which is like... I mean, like, I can't sing for shit, but, I mean, you will recognize that piece when you hear it. So there's the G major suite, second suite is the D minor suite, which is, um, you know, I can't really pick a favorite suite, but the D minor suite is what I played during my senior recital. Then there's the C major suite, which is suite number three, uh, the E flat major suite, which is number four, and then the last two are strange. Uh, suite number five is in C minor, and it's very um, weird, but it was actually written originally for a cello with the A string tuned down a whole step to a G. Um, and nowadays, the vast majority of uh, copies of the sheet music is transcribed for a cello tuned normally. Um, but if you find people who are doing authentic performances of the suites, you can actually like get them to tune down their A string, and it's very cool. It sounds, it gives the instrument an entirely different sound. And the very last suite, which is the D major suite, which I think is the hardest piece of music for the cello. Um, both like from an interpretive standpoint and a technical standpoint because it was actually written for a five-stringed cello, a cello with an extra string above the highest string. Um, it's a cello with an E string, basically, uh, and they, those basically don't exist unless you get them custom-made. Um, it was a Baroque thing, when, which was the period when Bach lived, in case you didn't know. Um, I think occasionally you will find somebody who makes a five-string cello, but it's very, very hard to find performances. And, like, looking at the music, um, and looking at a five-string cello, the suite becomes a lot less technically difficult if you're, if that's what you're, like, looking at. Um, but, the, yeah, the E string on a five-string cello is actually, it'll be the same pitch as the E string that's the highest string of, uh, guitar. Just interesting fact for you. Um, and that's great, um, there's no such thing as a perfect Bach that I really like, uh, but, 
his fingerings and bowings are a really good place to start, if you ask me. Um, there's some things that I really, really like, and some things that I don't like and that I've changed, uh, but it's way better than the sheet music that I printed off online and was going with for a while. And then there's this, which is something that I've needed for a long-ass time. It is a metronome and a tuner, and basically, if you're going to get good at playing an instrument, and if you're going to get good effectively in a certain period of time, you're going to need one of these. You're going to need a metronome. This thing also has, like, a built-in tuner, so, like, you can get it to, to a tone. Like, this is an A, basically, so I can use this to tune. I can use it to make drones and practice intonation, and it's incredibly useful, but obviously you use it for the metronome, so you can, like, work things up to tempo, and, um... Yeah, it's actually already really helped my playing a lot. So that's very cool, um, and that's basically all of the cello stuff that I have to show you today. And then, was there one other thing? I don't think so. I think we're ready to talk about my Toho keychains. Oh god. I think I'm gonna cut the video here, take a brief pause, and I will be right back. 